The uh, Rules Committee will come to order. We are here for the consideration of two measures, uh, H.R. 2112, the um, Consolidated and Further Continuing Appropriations Act Conference Report, and uh, H.R. 10, the uh, Regulations from the Executive and Need of Scrutiny Act, the RAINS Act. We're going to consider <coughs> both measures today. Original jurisdiction will follow our consideration of the um, conference report. Is Mr. Kingston here to testify? Uh, I'm here just to listen. To listen. Okay, good. Well, that's, that's the way we like it. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, let me, let me express my appreciation to uh, both of you for being here and for your... Uh, and for your hard work, and uh, you have an audience with Jack Kingston, we're happy to say, um, and we'll listen as well. So without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will appear on the record in their entirety, and we welcome your summary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Slaughter and members of the committee. I'm pleased uh, to appear today on the, uh, on the conference report on H.R. 2112 the Consolidated and Further Continuing Appropriations Act for 2000. Twelve. I'm here to request a traditional conference report rule for consideration of the report on the House floor. The House passed uh, H.R. 2112, the bill making appropriations for the Department of Agriculture, Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration, and related agencies on uh, June 16th. The bill uh, has since been amended to include the Commerce, Justice, Science, and Transportation HUD appropriations bills, as well as a continuing resolution to keep the rest of the government operating until December 16th. With the help of our ranking member, Norm Dix, we successfully negotiated with our Senate counterparts to craft this agreement, which is the first appropriations conference report since 2009, and I'm told is the very first conference report of this Congress for any mm -hmm. uh, act. Um, it's true. This report is the uh, next step in meeting the spending targets set by the Budget Control Act, which will save the taxpayers billions and help continue the effort to bring the nation's deficit uh, under control. Uh, in fact, this bill keeps us on track to cut regular discretionary spending by $98 billion dollars compared to the President's fiscal year 2012 request, and some $47 billion below the fiscal uh, 2010 level. When all appropriations work this year is completed, it will be the second year in a row that we have reduced total discretionary spending, a remarkable and historic achievement. Uh, so with the uh, report of this conference, the first since 2009 with the Senate, and the first conference report this year in the Congress, uh, I think Norm Dix and I can tell you that uh, there's at least something in this Congress that works. And it's called the Appropriations Committee. And I'm proud of that. The three underlying bills in this uh, report will reduce base discretionary spending by $757 million below last year. Yet, while we made significant cuts, we were also able to fund important priorities, such as food and drug safety, research on devastating crop diseases and pests, rural economic development housing, and highway improvements and construction. We've also provided a responsible level of disaster funding to help communities and businesses recover from record-breaking natural disasters. We have people hurting out there, and we're trying to be responsive to their cries for help. We've scrubbed the information from the agencies and were able to reduce the disaster spending in this bill by $850 million compared to the Senate passed bill. Additionally, the legislation contains important policy provisions that will reduce the size and scope of the federal government, help create jobs, and protect the sanctity of life and constitutional rights such as those under the Second Amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I hope to see swift passage of this legislation so that we can prevent a government shutdown, get to work on the remaining nine appropriations bills for fiscal 12, and continue the responsible budgeting that will reduce federal spending and help bring down our deficits. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Dix. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This conference report, the first minibus, includes the Agriculture, Commerce, Justice, Science, and Transportation HUD bills, along with a clean CR for the remaining nine bills. The CR prevents a government shutdown, as the Chairman has mentioned, and is a simple date change to December 16th which happens to be my birthday. Oh, my gosh. And Happy Bill birthday. Young's birthday. Happy birthday to both of you. And uh, Marcella Leahy's older? birthday. Beethoven. You were uh, uh, I think Bill's a young. little bit older than I am. Okay, yeah. I just wondered. I, uh, no heard. anomalies are added. Everything but the data is carried forward from the last CR. The three bills include disaster relief of $2.3 billion, including disaster funds for agricultural programs, highways, roads, and bridges, providing the full amount needed to address the backlog of eligible disaster repairs, <coughs> CDBG, and EDA. The conference report also <coughs> drops uh, writers on the Dodd-Frank financial reform, women's health, and climate change. The conference agreement restores funding cuts in nutrition programs, as the chairman has mentioned, as such as WIC and SNAP, which is uh, food stamps, food safety, law enforcement, science innovation, highway and transit programs, and housing. I am disappointed in some elements of this compromise, especially funding for CFTC, and which we'll have another shot at on financial services, and the Legal Services Corporation, which wasn't too bad. But I will support this measure, and, and every all the Democrats have signed the conference reports. Uh, I am sure each member here has his or her own list of items to score as victories and defeats. Mostly, I hope, victories. That is the nature of resolving our differences in Congress. Nobody gets everything they want. And I would just mention that uh, this year we did get six bills to the floor, and I said to the chairman, I hope that next year we can get all 12 of them. And because we don't have to worry about the, hopefully not have to worry about this bill, we have to finish it in December, uh, these 12 bills, uh, we can do that. In my view, this conference, re conference report re represents a reasonable compromise. It also is the first conference report of this Congress, and I believe it, it's, it marks another step in restoring regular order. And since I've been here so many times this year, I want to make sure that, that we recognize the hard work of the Rules Committee. We think we're doing a good job in our committee, but you have to do well, a lot of hard work here, too, sorry, and we've been here many times. Could you repeat that? Well, I just said that we appreciate the hard work of the Rules Committee. Oh, thanks. We're glad somebody does. Yeah. The governor of Texas doesn't seem to think we're doing that much. But anyway. we go part-time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't remember that. <laughs> That's when we all go part-time. Well, gentlemen, let me uh, express appreciation to both of you. I've enjoyed working with, with both of you on this. And as you know, uh, I'm particularly proud of the fact that we've been able to open up this process. Right. And, and you, Norm, have been very generous in acknowledging, it goes without saying from Harold, but you've been very generous in acknowledging that we have been that we have been able to uh, have uh, a process that has uh, been a heck of a lot different than we've gone through for the last few years. And I appreciate your very kind words of support for what it is we're trying to do. We haven't agreed on every single issue, but I do think that the, able, the ability of, of members to participate and be involved, uh, and, and it was a painful time, and I had Democrats who came up to me when we were uh, in in the midst of our whatever it was 140th amendment asking me HR1 yeah yeah why the hell i had uh, you know continued <laughs> to campaign in behalf of an open amendment process but uh, it was the right thing for us to do because there had been uh, what can be best described as pent up demand uh, for that and you guys uh, were the ones who had to stand there i think you probably Regretted it a little bit, uh, but no, you really didn't because you you did a phenomenal job. Every time I turned on the TV when I woke up in the middle of the night, there you were, standing there uh, going through uh, all this. So I, I do thank you for the work that you've done, and I appreciate the fact that we've gotten to uh, a bipartisan agreement uh, on this. This appropriations process has not been fun. I, I take my hat off to you all because Harold's the one who coined the term. This is no longer the Appropriations Committee. It is the Disappropriations Committee. And uh, you all have had to make some tough decisions, and uh, we're trying to be supportive of that. Democrats and Republicans alike acknowledge that we can't continue down the path with a $14.5 trillion national debt as we have, and um, you know, and Mr. Chairman, your leadership has made that happen. I could add this. Uh, uh, it has been a hard year. H.R. Uh, 1, uh, which took up so many weeks yeah. of time, uh, before that, which kept us from doing our regular business right. for the ensuing year, 
And then immediately after that, we had uh, uh, the hearings on our bill, 150 yep. hearings in the, in the committee. And then immediately after that uh, came along the debt ceiling uh, uh, debate, yep. which took so much time and effort. Uh, but in the meantime, this committee has held 150 uh, hearings to oversee the uh, mm -hmm. spending of the money that was appropriated. Uh, we have uh, dealt with 500 amendments on the floor mm -hmm. of the House on these bills this year. Uh, and so it's been, a, it's been a lot of work, uh, and I've had a great partner in that effort, uh, Norm Dix. Uh, he and I share the uh, commitment to return the committee and the process to regular order, open rules, transparent operations so that people can see how their money is being spent, uh, and uh, have a say-so in it. Uh, with all of these amendments, uh, every penny has been looked at three or four times. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm proud of the work the committee uh, is doing, and I think we're well on the way to restoring uh, regular order. You are, and let me just say uh, something that I you, you you hit a point that is so extremely important. One of the one of the priorities that that I continue to to have, regardless of who is in the White House, is this issue of oversight. I mean, naturally, when the party in power is in both the Congress and the White House, there is, regardless of party, there seems to be a little less oversight when the party opposes the party in the White House. There's more oversight. I think that it should be recognized as an institutional responsibility for oversight. And the fact that you've had 150 hearings overseeing these dollars is, uh, I mean, it allows Democrats and Republicans to ask questions, and I think that's a very important thing. One of the tasks that I have I'm particularly proud and find is probably my most fulfilling work is working as the, the head of the House Democracy Partnership, where we have partnered with uh, now 16 different countries, new and re-emerging democracies from Mongolia, Indonesia, East Timor, Kenya, Liberia, Haiti. I've just come back from Peru and Colombia where we've been working with these parliaments. And one of the things that we say as they begin to get their sea legs is that it's very important for the parliament to have oversight over executive branch decisions. And you all are setting an example with that. And I want to encourage even more of it so that as we continue to set this example for, uh, for other countries around the world that we are taking on this very important responsibility. So I congratulate you all for that. I have no questions. And just want to say again, thanks for your uh, great and very important work. And we look forward to many more great things to come, and we'll be uh, waiting here enthusiastically. I have to say that while the Appropriations Committee is something that works, the Rules Committee works as well, I'm happy to say, and we've been able to move these things forward. Amen. You do. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank both of you for being here and to uh, acknowledge uh, perhaps as uh, Norm did and you did too, Chairman, the uh, enormous work. Uh, not only that uh, you have been engaged in the number of hearings that have been held, but also to highlight uh, really your staff, not only the staff director of the Appropriations Committee who has made himself available to me several times at, with member requests that I had or were seeking help with, uh, but also to thank your members. I think it's one thing you're showing up as representatives today, but I hope you'll go back and say, you know, that, that the Rules Committee is uh, – does a lot of work, but they acknowledged ours too. Uh, I know it's also bicameral. I know it's taken a lot of uh, time on both your side, both your time. Both all, both of you have taken time to do that. But I think it's important that um, as we move forward, too many times people come up here and say, well, I went and negotiated this, and the other side said, yes, and we were shut out or did not have a chance to provide input. And I think that the leadership that both of you provide uh, as well as your uh, your uh, chairman of your subcommittees, uh, including the, the gentleman from Georgia, uh, who evidently will address us here in a few minutes, Mr. Kingston. No, he's not. Uh, well, he's then, here to listen. He's here to listen. I'd like to acknowledge then at least Mr. Kingston, who I know has attempted to do the same thing, and that is work on both sides. And I think it's important for us to set that uh, as a bar, as a mark, as a standard it should be followed as much as possible, even when we disagree with each other. And so, well, and a lot of very sensitive programs. The Agriculture Committee did work with uh, Sam Farr and uh, 
Rosa DeLauro with Chairman Kingston, and they've, they've taken some of the pain out of this uh, legislation and, and, and protected some very sensitive programs. You know, Norm, I would agree with that, but my point is that Jack's consideration of fair play, right? notwithstanding he probably has the votes, uh, his his satisfaction of himself knowing the right way to deal with things. And I think that comes from the top. I think it comes from both of you, and I darn sure know it comes from your staff director who is doing a fabulous job. And so I, I hope you'll go back and tell them, you know, we showed up somebody else's parade, but they thanked us too. So thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Nice to hear that compliment for Mr. Ingley. I wish I could make the same claim here at the Rules Committee. Uh, Ms. Slaughter. Okay. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any questions, but I'd also like to thank the two gentlemen for their efforts. Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I, let, me, um, let me begin by thanking both of you and, and your staff for the, for the work. Um, I appreciate the, um, the efforts to try to take some of the pain out of the nutrition uh, programs, and I think that's very helpful. And, um, and you know, the chairman of, the, of our committee here has talked about oversight. Two of the bills that are in here weren't even considered on the House floor. Um, and I worry about some of the riders that are in this bill uh, that don't belong there. I mean, there's a rider on truck size and weight limits that, um, that expands truck size and truck weight limits in a couple of states, which I think is going to put pressure on other states to do the same thing. And there are safety issues and there are financial issues involved in uh, cost to, to states. I mean, th this is the kind of thing that should have a hearing. <laughs> And that should be out in the open and marked up. Uh, there's a rider overturning the reauthorization of the school meal regulations that we enacted in the last Congress. Uh, there are two airdrop provisions in the bill, one dealing with sodium levels of school lunches and another dealing with tomato paste that treats pizza as a vegetable. And I, I, I just I worry about these riders because I remember, you know, uh, in the previous, uh, uh, previous Congress uh, when – the chairman's party w was in control that you know, there were airdrop provisions uh, to protect drug companies uh, uh, and um, you know uh, that were airdropped into appropriations bills and conference reports and um, I guess my I, mean, I, I want to be able to support this because I think it's better than what was came out of the house and I'm just curious how many riders are in this report and how many of these riders have been airdropped if anyone has a clue I thought we were getting away from that There were there were no airdrop. Uh, well, what about the the the, uh, the issue on on sodium the sodium levels? That wasn't any 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 bill, I don't think, or or treating tomato paste as a vegetable. The, uh, that provision was an amendment in the Senate bill. It was not airdrop. I just don't understand. What, you know, these some of these things have far-reaching consequences. That it just seems to me that, and again, I'm not blaming you. I mean, you you, you have to end up dealing with what you got to deal with. But I mean, I some of these things really don't belong in an appropriations bill. They belong in a, you know, in in in, uh, in other legislation. And um, you know, I don't know. How many of these policy riders are in, in this bill? But I, I, it's just a concern. And again, we talk about oversight. I'm worried. I'm worried about. I'm worried about the lack of oversight on some of these provisions. I'm worried about the lack of oversight right now with the super committee, uh, and that we're, we're writing a farm bill in secret that none of us are, are going to see. Um, so I, I, again, I'm not. I'm just kind of venting. You happen to be here, but I appreciate what you did to try to make this bill better. And um, but I do worry about these policy provisions that have not had hearings. You know, I don't care whether they came from the Senate or wherever that that are um, that I think have have deeper implications that really deserve the full attention of the House, and they're not going to get it in, in, in this process. So um, again, I thank you for your efforts. I, you have a, a difficult job, and um, and again, I appreciate your help in trying to make the pain on the nutrition programs uh, better, uh, a lot less. So thank you. If it's, any yeah. if it's any consolation to you, uh, bear in mind this is a conference report where both houses of Congress, both parties, uh, scrutinized every letter in the bill. So there was a there was that degree of oversight, if you will. Yeah, and and, and I appreciate that, but 
and, and just again, not to belabor the point, but there are, like for example, you know, um, you know, on truck size and truck weight limits, expanding them for 20 years in a couple of states. I mean, there are people on the transportation committees that I think should have some oversight responsibilities of that, and um, you know, and, and even on the uh, on the issue of uh, school lunches. I mean, there are we have committees that have that are responsible for writing the child nutrition reauthorization bill that should have scrutinized that. So, again, I, I just I point it out because there's, to me, these things don't belong in this bill. Uh, they're there, and we're going to have to live with them. And, um, you know, I, uh, I thank the, both of you and your staff for your work. Thank you. Um, I haven't made up my final mind on this particular bill, but I hope I can support it, even though it's not as good as the House versions. But then somebody has to deal with the senators. It's a nasty job, and I appreciate your willingness to take that on. <laughs> Yield back. I uh, echo my colleague, uh, a good friend from Utah's comments, as well as Mr. McGovern's. Mr. Um, uh, Chairman and uh, ranking member, all of us appreciate uh, uh, what uh, the two of you do and how difficult it is for the whole committee. I I just, every mayor and county commissioner that I've spoken with in the congressional district that I'm privileged to serve, as well as in some places around the country that I do not have that privilege, all of them support very strongly the Community Development Block Grant Program. And uh, to a man and woman, I... I I'm sure all of us have stacks of letters or emails uh, from uh, various of our uh, jurisdictional uh, components regarding CBDG. Um, President Obama's plan proposed a $300 million cut, and this measure has um, a $192 million, a little bit more, $192.9 and I'm not quarreling with that. I just, but when our nation is facing the utmost challenges, I, I just don't think we can afford to cut programs and initiatives that are working um, uh, for families to secure stable housing and to keep children in school. And just one final comment. I came to Congress supporting housing, and I guess uh, of the platform in 1992 that I advocated I advocated for every form of uh, housing uh, that would help people in our respective communities. <laughs> housing support and homelessness programs, in my view, in this measure, have taken a beating in this conference report and had cuts across the board. Uh, the budget cuts could delay implementation of the Hearth Act and limit McKinney-Vento homeless assistance grants preventing some homeless programs. And other programs are also at risk, and the two of you don't have any peers here that do as much or, or, or more for veterans than most of us. Uh, but SHAMSA, the um, supportive housing uh, program uh, for homeless grants, or uh, uh, elderly and disabled housing uh, within HUD and funding for runaway and homeless youth programs all take a hit. And I just, I can't make it make sense that we find it okay, not the two of you, all of us in Congress, to pay for 150 Tomahawk missiles for a no-fly zone to fight against what I believe all of us perceived are and were human rights violations in Libya. And yet we have an estimated 2 million people in this country experiencing homelessness right here at home. And we're getting ready in the next tranche of foreclosures uh, to see something that none of us have seen. Um, and there's going to be desperation moving into the election cycle and beyond. Um, and the pain is just so great. And I, 
I just take the position that I wish we, when we are offering our cuts, would make the poor people in our society, the most vulnerable people in our society, be the last people to have to experience uh, uh, downgrades. Uh, there are a whole lot of things in the budget that, including some of those Tomahawk missiles, that we could eliminate that might be able to help some of the things that I just discussed. And I don't invite a reaction. I thank you all so much. It's just painful. Uh, and I hope in the future, as we move toward those other appropriations measures, if you would just listen to me and start from the top with the cuts and try to keep the people at the bottom rung of our society um, held as harmless as possible. It's just not fair, and we can do better, in my judgment. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Newsom. Yeah, I just want to ask the Chairman and the Ranking Member, um, you know, uh, uh, what the path forward is on the rest of the, the federal uh, expenditures. Obviously, we've managed to get a few important departments here. We have other critical areas. Uh, I just want to ask the, the chair and the ranking member what, what, what the path forward is on the rest of uh, we rest had, the government. Uh, we had obviously hoped uh, to pass each bill individually uh, all year long. But uh, obviously, we passed six on the House side through the House floor. Uh, the Senate, on the other hand, uh, only passed one. And so we were left uh, waiting on them to act on the six that we sent over. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Um, the, uh, the Senate is right this minute considering the Energy and Water Appropriations Bill in the hopes that they could send that over here, but uh, that's not looking very good at this particular time. Um, if the Senate doesn't get their act together, you know, we'll have no choice but to uh, uh, do another minibus, the rest of the bus, in fact, uh, before December 16th when the uh, CR will expire. So I think, I, think, uh, uh, I think what I heard is that either, obviously, it's still some hope that the Senate would take up individual bills, but barring that, uh, the rest of the government would be in a rest of the bus by December 16th. Is that well, uh, you know, I, I don't care whether the Senate does each individual bill, which I don't think they can or will, or whether they do another grouping as they just did, these three bills. Uh, but I think the way things are looking, they won't be able to do either of those, which means we'll have to put together a uh, rest of the bus, the, the balance, the nine bills that are not done into a, either one or two packages. Okay. Mr. Dix, is that consistent with uh, where, where, where you think we prevent government from shutting down and keep things I, I think that I think there's ambiguity right now. We, we know we're going to take up these three bills on Thursday. I'm hopeful that they will pass with a significant majority in the House, um, and it's, they've already passed the Senate. And as the chairman pointed out, the, there's been some problems over there with whether they can add other bills to the energy and water bill. Uh, you know, probably at the end of the day, there's going to have to be another omnibus. And um, whether it emanates from the Senate or the House, I'd probably the Senate would start, and then we'd maybe add to it. But I think we're going to be here until December 16th, um, and, and maybe even beyond that. But I'd like to see us. My hope is that we can do this without taking a CR into next year because, you know, we want to focus on the next year's bills and not have to continue this uh, CR. That's my hope. Uh, before, you, before you do, let me just say, let me just say now, uh, there will not be a big CR for the balance of next year. Good. There might be an omnibus. We'll have to do an omnibus. We'll try to get an omnibus. That's but we're not going to do a CR at, at last year's levels for the balance of the year. Uh, we might have to do it for a very, very short span of time to give us time to do an omnibus bill. But we're not going to spend uh, the same as last year in a CR. 
Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, I yield back. haven't spoken up, and I uh, know that uh, Democrat and Republican alike, we are uh, very, very appreciative of your great efforts. And as I said, we look forward to more appearances here and um, look forward to working this measure on the floor with you. Mr. Chairman, I want to join my colleague in, in expressing our thanks to you and the members of your committee. Uh, I doubt there's a committee of the House that works harder than this one uh, at all hours, uh, on weekends included. So I, I want to say a, a word of appreciation for all of your sacrifice. To, uh, to well, this we're all in this together. And thank you for your uh, for your kind words. That'll close the uh, the hearing, uh, and uh, we have the rule out here yet. Okay, let's. The chair will be in receipt of a motion from the gentleman from Dallas. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule providing for the consideration of the conference report to accompany H.R. 2112, the Agricultural Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration, and Related Agencies Appropriations Act of 2012. The rule waives all points forward against the conference report and against this consideration. The rule provides that the conference report shall be considered as read. Finally, the rule provides that the previous question shall be considered as ordered without intervention of any motion except one hour debate and one motion to recommit if applicable. Yes, sir. Uh, you've heard the uh, motion of the gentleman. Let me just explain that, uh, as we all know, this is obviously the conference report covering uh, those items that we uh, we discussed, and it has a CR that goes uh, through. I guess this is the norm. So the 16th is his birthday, right? Of those, so the 16th of December, and um, this is obviously part of our continuing effort to get the appropriations work done, and um, this is a standard conference report rule. And so uh, are there any amendments? If not, the uh, vote occurs in the motion of the gentleman from Dallas. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. Sure aye. the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Ms. Fox will be managing this uh, rule for the uh, majority, and Ms. Slaughter for the minority. Now we will proceed to the uh, original jurisdiction consideration of the RAINS Act, this is a fascinating acronym, Regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny. That's a very creative. Uh, now regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny. Um, and the committee will now proceed with consideration of H.R. 10 as an original jurisdiction matter. The chair calls up the bill as reported by the Committee on the Judiciary, and the clerk will report the title. H.R. 10, a bill to amend Chapter 8 of Title 5, United States Code, to provide the major rules of the executive branch shall have no force or effect unless a joint resolution of approval is enacted into law. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with. The bill is open for amendment at any point, and uh, I'd like to recognize myself for the purpose of offering an amendment. The amendment which was shared with the minority last week and posted publicly yesterday addresses the expedited procedures in the bill. The major change in the amendment from the original proposal is that it allows the Speaker more flexibility in scheduling the resolutions of approval. It sets two days per month for the House to consider the resolution, and if we haven't considered it on by the third day on which it is eligible, the House must vote on the resolution of approval. The reality is that the Speaker, the Majority Leader, and the Rules Committee will be working very closely together to ensure that these resolutions are debated at a time that fits within the House uh, schedule. Regardless of your feelings on the overall bill itself, this is a straightforward amendment that simply uh, improves the expedited procedures and, uh, I believe, uh, deserves support. Is there any discussion on the amendment or amendments to the amendment? We have amendments to the amendment. Amendments to the amendment. Ms. Slaughter. Yes, Absolutely. Please do. Please do. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, what we're seeing here today is an attempt to take public protections, such as regulations to protect water and air, and throw them into the wood chipper of a divided Congress. Even the most well-regarded and popular programs in our country, Medicare, Social Security, assistance for veterans, will be thrown into red-hot political fights and tossed around as bargaining chips. The hope that by unnecessarily subjecting every governmental decision to a deadlock Congress, they can dismantle agencies and programs that protect and assist the American people every day. 
We all know that federal agencies can do only what Congress has authorized them to do. Agencies implement regulations to enforce law that Congress has already enacted. This way of governing is deeply rooted in our constitutional principle of the separation of powers. Congress writes the laws. We rely on professionals and experts, doctors, epidemiologists, botanists, statisticians, and so forth, to spell out the details of those policies so that the law can be implemented and enforced in a way that makes sense. We all know that Congress already has the power to reject any regulation that is not consistent with the intent of the law. The very last thing that the American people want to see is politicians inserting themselves where they don't belong. Work that requires professional expertise should be placed in the hands of professionals to complete uh, in a nonpartisan manner as they have always done. And I appreciate the Dreyer Amendment because I think it does a good job in trying to bring some sanity into this of having the House uh, oversee every regulation. But we think it is a little bit unworkable. We, the, uh, I think we have three or four amendments here that we would like to be. But there are just simply going to be too many of these approval resolutions to give them the thoughtful consideration they deserve. We'd end up having back-to-back -back votes on these things every few Thursdays, probably with no debate. That would be an extraordinary change to how we do business in the House. If we ended up voting on important legislation with no debate on a routine basis, and so let me grab the my amendment yield, to, I'll, I'll first. be happy I mean, to. I mean, I just, uh -huh. maybe I could offer a couple of comments since I really okay. get into this. But certainly. Just to, just to explain why it is that we, uh, we are where we are. Um, since 1996, and obviously that's Democrats and Republicans, we, in 1996 we've, we've gone through, uh, you know, administrations of uh, President Clinton and eight years of President Bush and now President Obama, but since 1996, the executive branch has promulgated over 1,000, over 1,000 major rules, each of which had an annual cost that exceeded $100 million or beyond that. I mean, many well beyond $100 million. And, uh, you know, I was talking in the exchange that I had with Norm Dix and, and Harold Rogers on this necessity for us to have oversight of uh, the process and talked about the work that I'm doing with uh, 16 of these parliaments all around the world to help enhance their ability for oversight. And I think that this is a measure which is designed for us to play uh, a more vigorous role in the issue of oversight. And, you know, many of these regulations, and I think I don't, it's not the sole cause of the economic problems that we've got, but many of these regulations have played a role in undermining the opportunity for uh, job creators out there to do what needs to be done. I mean, we all, we share in a bipartisan way this quest of, of trying to create jobs. And even the President has acknowledged that there are some regulations, and we've been able to, in a bipartisan way, deal with some of them. And I think that the goal here is not to, you know, throw Medicare or Social Security or any of these things up as, you know, as, as great, you know, as footballs and, and used for negotiating and all that. That's not what the goal of this is. The goal is to make sure that we adequately oversee so many of these decisions that have been made by the executive branch. And um, I think that, that it just is, a, is it's part of our Article I responsibility. And, and that's why I appreciate very much the support of, of my amendment to try and make it, uh, you know, streamline the process so that we don't, you know, my goal is to ensure that we don't get bogged down with uh, this mess here. And so I think that our amendment is... Uh, the best way to approach it, and so if, if you'd like to offer amendments to uh, my amendment, we'd uh, certainly uh, welcome consideration of it. So I thank slaughter. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and we do appreciate your amendment. Uh, but I want to put on the record that H.R. 10 will not create jobs or improve the economy. Uh, when Speaker Boehner tried to make a connection between regulation and unemployment recently, the Washington Post fact-checker looked into the truthfulness of his claim and said overall his statement contained significant factual errors, giving him three Pinocchios. Well, I'm, if, if gentlemen yield, I, I mean, I wasn't talking about his statement. I was just saying, and, I, and I'm not making a stupid uh -huh. statement, I said that, you know, it's very clear that, that it's not the sole determinant, but the President has acknowledged that there are some regulations out there that have undermined the ability of small businesses and large businesses to create jobs, and that's right. why we've dealt with some of those. So I'm, I, that's, that's what our goal is. And we have that do that. Is, is their job is to look over those right. regulations, and, and I, I don't like to interfere with that. 
Uh, Bruce Bartlett always said it was just nonsense, made up the idea that cutting regulations would create more jobs. Uh, Wall Street Journal's survey of business economists agreed as well, finding the main reason U.S. companies are reluctant to step up hiring is scant demand rather than uncertainty over government policies. Uh, one of the majority's own witnesses previously before the uh, Judiciary Committee said that when it comes to linking jobs and regulations, the focus, quote, the focus on jobs can lead to confusion in regulatory debates, end quote, and that the employment effects of regulation are undetermined. Uh, that was Christopher DeMuth from the uh, Libertarian American Enterprise Institute, but let me get on to my amendment. Um, this would ensure that regulations that protect the health and safety of the American people are not undermined by this legislation. The rules ensure that we can breathe clean air, drink clean water, ride in safe cars, and avoid unnecessary injuries at work. The reason we take these things for granted is, at least to some extent, because we have a strong regulatory system that lets agencies do their job of protecting the American people. H.R. 10 would undermine that system. Especially ironic that our colleagues would want to cripple regulatory protections after a string of disasters in recent years that were tied to government regulators falling short including the BP oil spill, the West Virginia mining accident, and the financial crisis. If we enact this bill, the result will be long delays for rules that protect the public from health threats such as lead in children's toys, salmonella contamination in eggs, and unsafe conditions at work. Throwing roadblocks in front of these protections because of some ideological commitment makes no sense. My amendment makes sure that regulations that protect public health and safety would not be held up by this bill. In short, the amendment says that on page 6 after line 7, insert the following new subsection. H, the procedure set forth in this section and the other provisions of this chapter shall not apply to any rule relating to the public health and safety. Page 6, line 8, strike H, and insert I. Thank you very much, Mr. Well, let me just... Uh... I, I, I'm, I'm reluctantly going to urge uh, opposition to the amendment based on the following. I, 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 there is no desire on the part of any Democrat or Republican to undermine the potential uh, safety uh, risks that would exist. But that doesn't mean that the first branch of government should not have the ability to closely scrutinize, to look at those proposals with huge cost to them, in excess of $100 million, as I said in some cases, that are emanating from the executive branch. And I suspect, I suspect that in more than, a, you know, that in all the cases, if there truly is a question of safety and soundness, we will be doing everything that we can to uh, support those. So I'm going to urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment to the amendment. Uh, the vote occurs in the Slaughter Amendment to the amendment. Those in favor will say aye. 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 No. No. Roll call, please. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Sessions votes no. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox votes no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent votes no. Mr. Scott. No. Mr. Scott votes no. Mr. Webster. No. Mr. Webster votes no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter votes aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern votes aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings votes aye. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis votes aye. Mr. Chairman. No. And, and I vote no. And the, uh, the the chairman votes no. And the clerk will report the total. Uh, four yay, six nay. And the uh, amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the amendment? If not, the vote oh, yeah. is oh. Oh, you, oh, okay. But before Mr. McGovern does that, Please. if I may ask for unanimous consent, I have a a letter addressed to Chairman Dreyer and myself from 33 legal scholars and law school professors from throughout the country teaching administrative law or environmental law, very concerned about the impact that H.R. 10 would have on our system of government. May we have you now? Absolutely. And let, let me just respond by saying, I, you know, I come from Los Angeles, and uh, I am very, very uh, sensitive <coughs> to environmental concerns in that area, and I don't want to do anything. You can tell all 33 of them, I don't want to do anything that undermines uh, the uh, quality of the air that we breathe or the water that we drink, and uh, that's not going to be a priority for anybody that I know of, and if they are, they, if it is a priority, they shouldn't be serving here. That's my uh, personal view. 
Mr. McGovern, you have an amendment to the yeah, amendment? Before I do, Mr. Chairman, could I, I'd like to ask uh, unanimous consent, uh, because the uh, Ranking Member Slaughter represent, uh, mentioned this in her statement, uh, the, an, an article by Bruce Bartlett, who has uh, held senior policy roles in the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations and served on the staffs of Representatives Jack Kemp and Ron Paul, he wrote a, a, an article in the, yeah. that appeared in the New York Times entitled Misrepresentations, Regulation, and Jobs. I think that's a... Important. Without without objection, it'll appear in the record. Let me, uh, since we're in the process of inserting things in the record, recognize Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I have a letter in support of H.R. 10 from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and ask that it be included in the record. Without objection, it'll be included in the record, just so we can have our competing right. entries in no, the and, record and here. And, so that we, uh, and just briefly, Mr. Chairman, I, I really think this is a, a move to move the clock backwards uh, uh, in terms of environmental protections. Uh, in terms of education initiatives, in terms of civil rights. I mean, this is not, this is not a bill I think anybody should be proud of moving forward. But I have a couple of amendments. Uh, the, uh, the first amendment would be uh, the, the, the procedures set forth in this section and other provisions in this chapter shall not apply to any rule that would result a net decrease in poverty rate in the United States. I don't think we should be eliminating programs that have helped uh, that, are, that are lessening the poverty rate in this country, and I think this should be uh, accepted by the committee. Well, I thank the gentleman for his amendment, and I'm going to again encourage a no vote. I think that uh, obviously, um, who makes the determinant as to whether or not uh, some program is in fact uh, bringing the unemployment rate down, keeping it down? If there if there is evidence that is happening out there, I'm I'm convinced that it won't be. Uh, anything that that is rejected. But having said that, I think if I if yeah. I could finish. Let me just say that um, the, the cost of that needs to be addressed as well. And I think that looking at the cost-benefit analysis is something that under the RAINS Act will be done. And so you can't take a static approach to this creates jobs without taking into consideration the cost to taxpayers for whatever program that is. And I'm convinced that if it ends up that there is a great benefit in job creation and the cost to the U.S. taxpayer is negligible. It's something that will enjoy uh, bipartisan support. So I'm going to urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. Um, vote occurs on the McGovern Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. No. That's for roll call. Those clerk call the roll. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Sessions votes no. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox votes no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent votes no. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott votes no. Mr. Webster. Mr. Web Webster votes no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Mr. Slaughter votes aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern votes aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings votes aye. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis votes aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Chairman votes no. Report the total. Four yea. Seven nay. And the amendment is not agreed to. I have one additional amendment. Mr. Okay, Chairman. Mr. McGovern. Uh, on page six, after line seven, insert the following new uh, subsection H. The procedure set forth in this section and other provisions of this chapter shall not apply to any rule that would result in net decrease in food insecurity in the United States. In what? In food insecurity. In hunger. Oh, food insecurity. Yeah. We, we have 50 million people in America, oh, no, Mr. I, Chairman, who are right. food insecure or hungry. I and uh, and and you talk about cost benefit. I mean, the, the, that number of food insecure and hungry pe hungry people results in about 160 billion dollars in terms of cost in uh, in avoidable health care costs and uh, children not learning in schools and lost productivity. Not even getting into what it what it costs for SNAP or some other other nutrition programs. Um, I think you know that at a very at the very and and, and again I the reason why I bring this up is because um, I you were mentioning. Uh, the uh, Ryan budget before, and in the Ryan budget, uh, it block grants a, a number of uh, key nutrition programs. It cuts a number of key nu nutrition programs. I want I want to make sure that there there's a safety net in place, and that these programs that provide a circle of protection for the most vulnerable are eviscerated uh, for political purposes. Well, I share the goal of ensuring that those who are most vulnerable are in no way jeopardized, and the sense that all of a sudden passage of the Rains Act is going to prevent people from having access to uh, nutrition is, I think, a mischaracterization. And I will tell you that, uh, again, 
All we're saying is that these things need to be looked at and addressed, and I'm going to encourage my colleagues to. Yeah, and, and I base my concern based on some of the votes that have happened right. in this House of Representatives and in the past. So I understand. I understand. Yes, well. Vote occurs in the McGovern Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those aye. opposed, no. 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 Sure. Roll call. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Sessions. No. Ms. Sessions votes no. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox votes no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent votes no. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott votes no. Mr. Webster. No. Mr. Webster votes no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter votes aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern votes aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings votes aye. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis votes aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Chairman votes no. And the clerk will report the total. Four yea, seven nay. And the uh, motion is uh, not agreed to. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. I would like to say uh, that um, I believe uh, that Congress gives um, uh, these agencies the power to make regulations. And I, I just don't understand why don't we, uh, when we pass a law, just go ahead and write the regulations. Because what we're doing now is we're going to pass a law send it to an agency, they write the regulations, then we're going to spend our time on the floor of the House uh, debating regulations uh, that were written. And if there was ever a waste of time, I uh, consider that to be um, uh, sane. In addition, uh, regardless of what anyone says, it, it, it may, I think you have a thin line here where you're not approaching what you're doing being un unconstitutional. But you're surely undermining uh, the uh, important um, uh, constitutional pr principle of separation of powers. Um, if there was ever a clear example that, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues um, and the leadership of, uh, of the majority, is about one thing uh, at this point. I, I now sense that going into 2012, we're not going to do anything. Uh, at all. I'm not talking about the Rules Committee. I'm talking about Congress. And what we are doing from the majority's point of view is setting up every imaginable kind of obstacle, number one, to do nothing, and then to cause this president um, uh, to um, uh, not be elected. That is your prerogative. And I understand uh, the political dynamics. But I want you to remind you that the wind does not blow up the same dog's tail always. And there comes a time when some of this mess that y'all are doing is going to uh, uh, come uh, uh, to haunt you. Under this amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, do we expect that uh, the committee is going to report this rule out uh, today or when we come back? Or this is just the original jurisdiction uh, provision. We're not reporting the rules. All right. In that light, then, with it being an original jurisdiction measure, uh, do we intend, uh, we don't have any witnesses, are we going to have a hearing, or uh, are we just doing it? Uh, well, uh, this is, uh, what, what would you like to do? Tell me what you'd like to do. I'd like for us to have a hearing. I'd like for us to invite witnesses who could give us an understanding as to whether or not they feel it is undermining the, the separation of The only of thing that falls within our jurisdiction are the expedited procedures. We, the, the Judiciary Committee it, it held hearings, and I'm sure that my friend, if he's interested in it, would be welcome to... Uh, That's Jeff Davis's measure they held hearings on? Excuse me? Jeff Davis's measure, H.R. 10. Yeah, this is... Reigns, yeah, they, 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 held, uh, they held hearings on this. The, the committee they report, did. which is available. All we have jurisdiction over here is what you're seeking to amend my amendment on, which is simply the expedited procedures. That's, that's it. That's All right, Mr. Chairman. Here. That said, then uh, let me make it clear that I'm pretty sure that the argument's going to be made that my amendments are not germane. Uh, I say to you, uh, before you say it to me, uh, that um, if they were written as a part of the Dreyer Amendment, they would be germane. Mr. Chairman, my amendment uh, would exempt from the Reins Act or uh, any rule that the administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs of the Office of Management and Budget or uh, determines would result in net job growth. As we all know, there's no need, no uh, need more urgent than putting Americans back to work. And if a proposed rule is expected to create jobs, 
it should not be subject to needless delay by Congress. Well, I think the arguments that I've made stand uh, as it relates to the uh, McGovern amendments uh, as well, so I'm going to urge a no vote on the uh, amendment. The vote occurs on the Hastings Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. 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 Sure I ask for a roll call, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Sessions votes no. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox votes no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent votes no. Mr. Scott. No. Mr. Scott votes no. Mr. Webster. No. Mr. Webster votes no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Slaughter votes aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern votes aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings votes aye. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis votes aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Chairman votes no. Report the total. Four yay, seven nay. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hastings, my next amendment would exempt from the Reins Act any rule that is already subject to the Administrative Procedure Act. In the uh, APA, the Administ Administrative Procedure Act, Congress already passed a statute mandating a public, thorough, and lengthy process by which federal regulations must be developed. If a rule has already undergone such scrutiny, further approval by Congress presumably or without even half of the oversight required by the APA is simply needless and what I think this measure is redundant. Uh, you've uh, heard the motion, gentlemen. I'm going to urge a no vote based on the following argument, and that is I don't think that we can do too much when it comes to the issue of oversight. I think the fault that we have had has been allowing the proliferation of regulations from the executive branch without an adequate opportunity to scrutinize these measures. And so doing it one, two, three times, I think, enhances the goal that we have of job creation and economic growth and reining in the size and scope and reach of the federal government. But the chairman, you, of course, and you don't see that as causing the process to grind to almost a halt uh, when it comes on the to contrary, legislation? On the contrary, I see it, I see it as enhancing enhancing the ability for this institution to ensure that the executive branch doesn't do what I think Democrats and Republicans alike have acknowledged has taken place, gone off and promulgated regulations in areas that have been far beyond the purview. Because frankly, we have not done enough oversight. We need to do more oversight. And I think the RAINS Act is a step in that direction, so I'm going to encourage a no vote on the uh, gentleman yield. Amendment. Of course, I'm happy to yield. I'm sorry, I was in reference to the gentleman, Mr. Hastings. Well, I, Thank you. Are you, you. You have the time? Yes, I'm I sorry. do. Uh, would the gentleman engage me for Absolutely. a second? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I recall back uh, several years ago as we were having a hearing on the uh, health care bill, and the uh, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, I believe at the time, the gentleman, uh, Charlie Rangel, came and spoke with us, and we very clearly ask him for any econometric model or any modeling that would take place about the impact of jobs knowing that joint tax and a lot of other people had previously in bills uh, as they would engage the Rules Committee would provide that. And I recall very vividly Mr. Uh, Chairman Rangel saying, Mr. Sessions, this is about millions of net jobs being added to the American economy, just millions of jobs. There's no need for us to seek anyone else's opinion on this. Mr. Chairman, as you and I recognize, the more we are finding out, it will net lose millions of jobs. And the CBO director uh, earlier in the year spoke about net 800,000 jobs being lost. So I would like to just temper the discussion that you're having in support of the position that you've taken to say that perhaps there could be too much oversight. I'm not taking you on your words, but there should be an adequate or balanced amount of oversight. And so I'm going to err on the side of supporting what you're trying to accomplish, Mr. Chairman, and that is to satisfy the members that from their experience that for them to be able to offer their vote in support of or to defend why they might vote against something, that there should be an adequate amount of oversight that would be not only uh, permissible, but that really would be expected by this body. As members of this body, we bring varying degrees of service 
uh, that perhaps back home or from our professional content that we may have had. And I believe that what makes us better is an open process where we're able to ask questions, but certainly in an oversight role that uh, must be maintained. I, I, so I want to offer my full support of what I you're think, trying to speak with friend, and to help. And I will it, say that the only argument my, that I would, would, would uh, make of is I've never seen, I've never witnessed too much oversight. And I think that since we unfortunately continue to hear of a lack of oversight, uh, I, I really don't think that you can have too much. I think that the more you have, the more adequate it actually is, based on the observation that I've made of this. So the vote occurs in the Hastings Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. Pay the chair the no. Have it. Any further amendments? Mr. Polis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have an amendment to the Dreyer Amendment. Um, my amendment is uh, simple. And I, I um, uh, first of all, I think I, I'm not... Uh, an enormous fan of the underlying bill. I think, first of all, I'm generally a fan of uh, strong executive authority. I think they're, the executive is better at implementing than Congress. If Congress doesn't like it, they can give the executive less flexibility in the underlying laws. I mean, uh, it, to the extent the president is given flexibility, uh, Congress should not then micromanage how it's used. Certainly, there could be areas where we give the executive too much flexibility. We should choose to in the underlying legislation give more precise guidelines about the legislation. But, but that's, that's my comment about the underlying bill. My, my amendment is simple. Um, I think the, the meritous aspect of, of this uh, proposal is that it could potentially save money uh, if cost-benefit analysis shows that there are costs that are greater than benefits. Uh, perhaps we as a body should, from a fiscal standpoint, um, undertake an additional examination. Um, what my amendment would do is that if the benefits are found out way the costs, uh, it would not have to go through uh, this process uh, that we're talking about here. And in fact, between 1998 and 2008, major regulations promulgated in the aggregate are estimated to have cost 50 to 60 billion, but the benefits have been per estimated to be 120 to 660 billion. Now, that doesn't mean on every particular one the benefits outweigh the cost, but those are aggregate figures. Um, so, to the extent that these regulations uh, enhance our fiscal, fiscal situation, have a greater dollar benefit than cost, and of course this is done by objective analysis, far more objective than it can occur in a political body where people bring all sorts of agendas to the table. Uh, I don't think that those are the ones that we want to second guess. I think, I think the intentions of the RAINS Act is to find when the costs of regulations exceed their benefits. Uh, and and uh, those are perhaps to the extent that we want to Look at regulations again. We shouldn't have given the executive that uh, ability if Congress feels that it's it's being misused. But if you said he had that ability, uh, we can we can in, uh, look at those under my amendment when the when the costs outweigh uh, the benefits. So uh, that's the thrust of my amendment, and I would encourage the committee to I accept. I think the gentleman uh, does make an interesting point about the pattern that has existed of of uh, you know what, what really has been a pattern of not having the kind of Ability to rein in, no pun intended, uh, a lot of the regulations that have been promulgated, meaning that, that so many of the laws that have been passed have been so loose that they have given free rein to the executive branch to go far beyond what was the intent. And that's what I say, with more than a thousand regulations since 1996 that have cost well in excess of $100 million dollars, regulation. It seems to me that that's uh, the route that we should take. So I'm going to urge a no vote on the amendment. And the vote occurs in the Polish Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those aye. opposed no. Pin the chair that knows have it. Knows have it. Are there further amendments? Mr. Sessions. Oh, do uh, we not need to vote on mine, right? Yes. Yeah. And so uh, the vote occurs now on the bipartisan, all supported, Dreyer Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed no. Aye. Pin the chair the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Sessions. Thank, Thank you, you all very much for your support of the amendment. Sorry we couldn't accept these, uh, these other amendments. Too. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have an amendment. Let us get over. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, okay. Mr. Chairman, I, too, have an amendment. And uh, uh, bringing forth my ideas, uh, as you've seen here, the committee is very excited about discussing this and providing our input. And I, too, have input. My amendment requires 
uh, that an agency submitting a report on a proposed federal rule to include an assessment of anticipated jobs gained or lost as a result of that rule's implementation, and specifically whether those jobs will come from the private sector or the public sector. This assessment will be part of the cost-benefit analysis required to be submitted by the Comptroller General and make available to each member of the House prior to consideration of that rule. As you're aware, earlier this year I introduced HRS 72 and the House passed it by bipartisan vote of 391 to 28 on February the 11th. Uh, I believe my amendment serves to strengthen the bill by insisting that federal agencies begin to focus on job creation, uh, which I believe is one of the most essential uh, positions that this Congress should be a part of. We hear on a regular basis on, on from both Republicans and Democrats about how we foster uh, uh, this country in its endeavor to have more jobs. However, with this uh, amendment, I do recognize that the portion of the bill which I would have under this hearing uh, been submitting this to for uh, its consideration falls under the jurisdiction of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Gentlemen, yield. I would. I, I thank my uh, friend for yielding. And let me say that I think that, uh, that he's offering a very creative and interesting amendment, and um, as, as he knows, it's not germane to, as we discussed earlier, to this, the jurisdiction here in this committee uh, for original jurisdiction purposes, but of course, will be more than germane when it comes to uh, reporting out this measure under a special rule of the floor, and I'm, I'm sure that my friend will uh, make the uh, argument for his amendment uh, when, he, um, when we come and consider this measure to uh, go with a special rule of the floor. And thank you. And along the line of, as my colleagues have suggested, I don't want to provide any obstacle to getting in the way of oversight on this bill unnecessarily. And so this time I ask unanimous consent for don't withdraw my amendment. And I thank the chairman. Without objection, the amendment is withdrawn. Uh, are there any further amendments? If not, uh, without objection, the previous question is ordered on the bill. The question occurs on ordering the bill as amended. Favorably reported to the House. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. Pin the chair. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Sessions. Uh, aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Fox. Aye. Ms. Fox votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Yes. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Nugent. Yes. Mr. Nugent votes aye. Mr. Scott. Aye. Mr. Scott votes aye. Mr. Webster. Yes. Mr. Webster votes aye. Mr. Slaughter. No. Slaughter votes no. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern votes no. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Polis? No. Mr. Polis votes no. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Chairman votes aye. And the clerk report total? Seven aye, three no. And uh, the uh, bill is agreed to. And, and let me uh, just say that, of course, the minority is uh, entitled to file uh, dissenting views if, if the minority uh, wishes to do so. Uh, and without objection, the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the measure adopted today, and the chair is authorized to make such motions as may be necessary to go to conference with the Senate on this or a similar measure. So thank you all uh, very much and uh, appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to tomorrow's meeting, which is uh, 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So without objection, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>